Hello and welcome to Wellness Wednesdays. Today's topic is C for cancerous cell concerns and PEMF influencers or post electromagnetic field influencers. With today's question, would it be okay to improve North American cancer statistics? We hope you all answer yes. So we're talking about the A, B, C, and Ds of health concerns. I'm your host, Barbara Carr. I'm a certified health consultant with Bionic Health today. So some of the concerns we're talking about in connection with PEMF influences or post-electromagnetic field influences are A for arthritis, aches and pains, and acute trauma, B for brain and brainwave entrainment, C for cardiac and circulatory concerns, C for cancerous cell concern, which is today's topic, and D for diabetes. So what defines cancerous cells? Let's look at some causes of cell mutation and what has research told us, and also some options to promote cellular wellness. Cancer is a name of a collection of over 100 diseases that share common characteristics. Number A, uncontrolled growth of cells in the body. And they mutate from a normal cell growth and also a normal die off. B, the ability of these cells to migrate from the original site. And let's add in a C, which basically is already a presence of mutated cells in multiple sites that maybe simply are given the right opportunity for uncontrolled growth. And if we um, look at the difference basically in our belief of these uh, between A, B, and C, if we believe that there's only one um, large mass or lump or you know mother area where that cancerous growth is coming from, we will do everything within our power. Our focus and our fear level really is going to be focusing on that one lump area. But if we're looking at the aspect that there's multiple sites throughout our system, and that's been proven um, with autopsies of on young people that have died of other causes, and already at young ages, they are shown that cancer cells are present within the body at, at multiple sites. So if they're given the right opportunity for uncontrolled growth, maybe our focus would, would shift more to looking at that entire body rather than just one small area. So most tissues in the human body grow and divide to form new cells as our body needs them. We're constantly replenishing our cells. As cells grow old or damaged, they die and new cells take their place and that's the cycle of life, correct? The body has many safety features to ensure that this happens in an orderly fashion and knows when to stop. Regeneration is the ability for some organisms to replace or restore lost body parts. For example, flatworms, when they're cut, we know will regenerate either a new body or a new head depending upon where they're cut. Well, wound healing is really a kind of regeneration at the tissue level. Our broken bones will knit together or a cut will heal and I think all of us have experienced that aspect of regeneration at the tissue level. So if we look at the aspect of um, how a wound heals, the healing process, we start off with the wound, we go into an inflammation process, then a proliferation process, and then a tissue remodeling process. But what happens if that process is interrupted somewhere along that line? And particularly in that inflammatory stage, and as many people will take an anti-inflammatory after they've injured their, themselves, if we question that aspect of interrupting that normal healing process by taking an anti-inflammatory instead of letting the body naturally utilize that inflammation process to heal, um, what kind of disruption could we possibly be causing in our healing process? It's many, many times over and over and over again. So living organisms depend upon this aspect of tissues and organs constantly renewing themselves. Skin cells slough off within several weeks. The lining of the intestines epithelial cells may only live for a few days. Some tissue or organs may not regenerate a new organ, but actually have the ability to enlarge. For example, if up to 75% of the human liver is removed, the remaining lobe will enlarge enough to restore the original function. So if we look at this picture of this uh, donor liver here, fully functioning, full, um, uh, fully enlarged liver, and that donor gives away one third of that original lobe of the liver, 
that donor will grow that liver back or that liver will enlarge enough to restore the original function. If we look at the recipient, we see that third of a liver being given to the recipient. And over time, that recipient's liver will again enlarge to restore the original function. What it will not do, it just will not actually grow that extra lobe. Okay, so it will enlarge the both donor and recipient have an enlarged enough liver to restore our original function, and that is the basis of being able to do uh, transplant for a liver. Other organs such as kidney, pancreas, thyroid, adrenal glands, gonads, lungs, have varying degrees of enlargement capabilities to compensate for removed or damaged portions. And it's just an incredible way that our body systems have been designed to protect ourselves and to have a self-healing mechanism. So what goes wrong with that mechanism? What causes cells to mutate? Well, many theories have been suggested and evolved over the years, but the basics really are that the cell has been disrupted from its normal course, disruption that affects the integrity or the function of the cell. So the homeostasis or balance of our cells and systems to work together smoothly is simply out of balance. So if we look at health is balance in the system, then could we examine the fact that possibly we do not catch diseases, but we build them, or we cause that imbalance within the system or have a degree of um, uh, some ability to control that balance in the system. So in the book, Cancer is Not a Disease, It's a Survival Mechanism, Andreas Moritz points out that cells that are put under stress by exposure to toxins, inflammation, and cellular stress can cause changes in the cell's actual mitochondria. So we know that the cells stop taking in oxygen and begin using glucose instead to produce energy. Oxygen provides far less fuel for cancer cells than glucose does. So the ratio is only two energy molecules instead of 36 with sugar. So you can see the very difference between that um, rapid feeding frenzy that glucose will provide to a um, damaged cell versus oxygen that's providing fuel. So also the cells refuse to die. They multiply and create a protective layer, which makes them even harder to kill. French scientist Antoine Deschamps uh, told us about 150 years ago that cancer and most other illness is caused by a combination of toxins and poor cellular terrain. So what is cellular terrain? And I just love that description of the ability for us to look upon ourselves basically as this garden. So a healthy or diseased biological terrain is determined primarily by four things. Number one, the acid alkaline balance or the pH balance. Number two, the electric magnetic charge, negative or positive. Number three, the level of poisoning or the toxicity level. And number four, the nutritional status. So let's look at the acid alkaline balance or the pH balance. The pH scale ranges from zero to 14 and seven being neutral. Below seven becomes increasingly acidic and above seven increasingly alkaline. For optimal cellular health, your blood pH must be slightly alkaline with a pH between 7.365 and 7.45 versus the outer area of our skin, for example, has a more acidic uh, balance. So looking at the electromagnetic charge, either negative or positive, healthy cells will carry an electromagnetic negative charge, whereas damaged or fermentative cells and their acids will carry an electromagnetic positive charge. So when we go back to this cell wall or the mitochondria, uh, we see that the inside of that mitochondria is a negative balance, such as a healthy cell, and that allows minerals, nutrients, and oxygens to enter the cell along with osmosis aspects. And it should allow toxins, carbon dioxide, and water to be released out of the cell back into that positive atmosphere uh, in between the cellular interstitial fluid, basically. So let's look at the level of poisoning. Um, Sherry Rogers, MD, in her books, Detox, book, sorry, Detoxify or Die, prevent, present the incontrovertible evidence that environmental chemicals are everywhere and we cannot avoid them. 
For example, studies have shown that breast milk of Inuit mothers reveal some of the highest levels of modern chemical poisons. Well, how is that possible? Are there factories up there? Absolutely not. <laughs> or not to the degree that would cause this um, chemical influx. But we do know that chemicals get out of the air, they carry in the air curtains, they're currents around the world, they get into our water, they get into our food supply. Um, we know that we actually live in an extremely polluted environment and that goes throughout the world. So looking at a report of environmental toxins actually found in newborns' cord blood, and this was reported by Sherry Ubelocker in the Canadian Press, uh, posted in 2013. And this was also um, studies that were similarly done down in the U.S. as well. The environmental defense tested the umbilical cord blood of three anonymous newborns in Toronto and Hamilton, finding a total of 137 chemicals overall. The number of toxins in each baby's cord blood ranged from 55 to 121. Among them were flame retardants, PCBs, PFCs found in nonstick coatings, and then organochlorine pesticides. Many of the chemicals are linked to serious health conditions. 132 are reported to cause cancer in humans or animals. 110 are considered, considered toxic to the brain and nervous system. And 133 cause developmental and reproductive problems in mammals, the group says. Environmental Defense also screened for 209 different PCBs and found 96 overall in the baby's core blood. PCBs, which have been linked to cancers in both animals and humans, were banned in Canada in 1977. So here in 2013, they're finding those in the newborn blood. It's a pretty scary aspect of how prevalent toxins are within our whole world system. So looking at our nutritional status, um, do we have poor soil conditions? Are fruits and vegetables picked before ripening? Are we eating processed fast food diets or diets high in sugars? How much nutrition is actually in the food we eat? And there was a study done, and um, basically uh, the average North American spends between three and four hundred dollars on nutritional supplements alone per month. But if those um, people are actually purchasing three to four hundred dollars of nutritional supplements, but their cells aren't in a place to be able to accept that, um, what percentage of that three to four hundred dollars is actually being received into that cell as far as nutrition is concerned? And you know, could it be a, a very, very low percentage that's actually being taken in? So looking at some live blood cell analysis pictures, and we're seeing two very differing pictures here. The picture in the top here shows a nice uh, ripe, plump, round, well-functioning red blood cell. Um, if this was live, you would actually see this interstitial um, movement of fluid in between. We see that this would be an, an optimal environment for getting nutrition into the cell and toxins out versus this picture below of obviously not a very um, bright picture here. We see this low or this sticking together and these lumps of red blood cells stuck together. We see this aspect of them bringing together other cells and starting to form a lump and how difficult is it going to be for oxygen to get in here and you know start to form basically a precancerous lump or possibly even a cancerous lump here and this is actually a picture of my red blood cell analysis done a few years back when I was not feeling very well and you could obviously see why I was not feeling well. So one critical symptom of disease terrain is low oxygen. Another is a stoppage of movement or stagnation in the colloidal body fluids actually between the cells. And still another is a loss of electrical charge on the surface of red blood cells. And this contributes to a condition called RILO, which we just talked about. This glue-like sticky blood condition causes more healthy cells to become stuck and oxygen deprived. So you can see it just attracts more and more and more and gets into a larger and larger lump system. So uh, investigating the germ theory. So some theories have suggested that exposure to germs or bacteria will create disease. And that was Louis Pasteur's famous germ theory. Now at the same time, Antoine Duchamp, who we discussed, was also looking at the aspect of um, disease being caused because of a poor biological terrain. So they really were in direct opposition. 
um, Louis Pasteur suggesting that no, everything is caused by this invader that comes into our body and causes this disease process. Whereas Antoine Bouchamp was saying, well, but yes, it's really caused because of this poor uh, environment already that, and along with this, that germs could possibly take control over or take advantage of. So we know that germs are bacteria or scavengers that feed on decaying tissue. They really are the result of disease, not usually the cause of it. Um, so if we clean up or eliminate decaying tissue, germs or bacteria will have very little effect on healthy tissue. So they're really scavengers that are attracted to the food at the garbage dump. They don't create the dump. So if we go back to this biological terrain aspect and clean up our biological terrain, what concern, or who we should not have as great a concern that germs are actually the causative agent here. So we know that viruses, funguses, bacteria, parasites, parasites have been a part of our life since Earth began. So what are our bodies being exposed to in our North American industrialized culture? What is causing skyrocketing cancer statistics far beyond that of other cultures and nations and previous times in history? That's a good question. So are we being exposed to a higher degree of acidic processed foods, demineralized soil, and plant foods leading to a less alkaline system? Are we exposed to electromagnetic pollution fields that are beyond the natural biological window? What about exposure to toxins that we've discussed in our water, food, air, and products that we use on our bodies? What about toxins from medication and other drugs and treatments that most of us are being exposed to or taking? And what about in, inadequate nutritional value at the cellular level? And as we discussed before, possibly getting nutrition into our bodies but in a poor biological terrain, is that nutrition actually being able to be brought into that cell where it can be utilized? So what options do we have to positively influence our biological terrain? Well, we could increase the alkalinity in our diets. We could limit the amount of electromagnetic pollution we are exposed to and or increase the amount of biologically correct electromagnetic field exposure. We could decrease our toxins to talk or our exposure to toxins and help our cells, systems, and bodies in the elimination process of toxins and decayed debris. We could improve our nutritional uptake into our cells. And we can increase the circulation and movement of fluids both inside and outside the cells. So all aspects that we do have control over. So what impact would pulse electromagnetic fields or PEMF? have to positively influence our biological terrain. Well, we know that pulse electromagnetic fields or PMFs target 70 to 75 trillion cells. They're basically targeting our entire system. And that's kind of the aspect of earthing or um, being exposed to a, the electromagnetic field or the human resonance that uh, we were designed to live within. PMF has been documented to positively influence circulation the flow of nutrients, water, and electrical communication both in the cell's mitochondria and throughout the body. So go, going back to some of those aspects of poor biological terrain, looking at you know, being able to positively influence that biological terrain. Now let's look at a few studies that have been done. And this one is low intensity and frequency pulsed electromagnetic fields selectively impair breast cancer cell viability or the ability for breast cancer cells to live. This was done in 2013 and all of these uh, research studies you can find on or access through our Bionic Health Today website. So they go on to say that they investigated the potential of ultra low intensity and frequency pulsed electromagnetic fields or PEMFs to kill breast cancer cells. The results they observed this discrete window of vulnerability of MCF7 cells, which are a breast cancer cell that is used in research. So they exposed these breast cancer cells to PEMFs of a 20 hertz frequency and a three micro Tesla magnitude or you know, um, uh, aspect and exposure duration of 60 minutes per day. 
But the cell damage, they say, accrued in response to PEMFs increased with time and gained significance after three days of consecutive daily exposure. So after only three days of, of daily exposure of the 60 minutes per day, they were seeing um, results actually coming. So by contrast, the PEMFs parameters determined to be most killing or cytotoxic to these breast cancer cells were not damaging to normal cells, breast cancer, or breast cells. So isn't this the perfect aspect that we're looking for, a non-invasive treatment aspect that will kill off the cancerous cells but not harm the positive cells within the body, or in this case within the breast cells. So looking at another um, report that was done with changes in cell death of peripheral blood lymphocytes, and these were isolated from children with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and it was done with a stimulation at 7 hertz and 30 microtesla pulse electromagnetic fields. This was done in 2015. And the abstract was pulse electromagnetic field, or PEMF, influenced the viability of proliferating in vitro peripheral blood mononuclear cells, which were isolated from Crohn's disease patients as well as acute myoblastic leukemia patients. So they induced cell death but did not cause any vital changes in cells from healthy donors. So again, a non-invasive therapy that is killing these damaged cells or cancerous cells without causing any vital changes in cells from healthy donors. So they're keeping the cells healthy, keeping the healthy cells healthy. Looking at A3 adenosine receptors, which are involved in the processes such as inflammation and immune responses, and they help increase that aspect. So the anti-tumor effect of A3 adenosine receptors is potentiated or increased by pulsed electromagnetic fields in cultured neural cancer cells. And this was the study that was done in um, 2012. And together, these results demonstrated that PEMF exposure significantly increases the anti-tumor effect modulated by these A3 ARS. So not only are we looking at pulse electromagnetic field systems that could influence the death of cancerous or diseased cells, not affect good healthy cells, but they also increase some of these uh, aspects of our body system to fight off um, or have this anti-tumor effect. So very important um, aspects of what PEMF can do within our body systems. So if a healthy biological terrain can be determined primarily by these four things, then if we, number one, create a more alkaline blood balance, number two, create a negatively charged cell membrane to attract nutrition, oxygen, and these minerals and water into the cells, and encourage the release of toxins and waste out of the cell. And number three, if we decrease the toxins we're exposed to from many different levels, and also at the same time help the body to release the toxins that are inside our systems by increasing circulation and elimination. And number four, we improve our nutritional status and the cell's ability to use nutrition. Would we have healthier cells, organs, and bodies? Good question. So another question now would be what pulse electromagnetic fields will best positively influence our biological terrain. If we know from studies, and these are just a few studies that I've pulled out, there are thousands and thousands of studies that have been done worldwide on pulse electromagnetic field systems and the effect that they have on our body systems. So um, the pulse electromagnetic field system, the IMRS, again targets 70 to 75 trillion cells within our bodies. Pulsed electromagnetic field devices for home use have been on the market for more than two decades. Swiss Bionic Solutions, the only company in the world with its own in-house research, engineering, development, and manufacturing divisions, is the world leader in PEMF systems for home use. Over 60% of all PEMF systems sold in the world are manufactured and marketed by Swiss Bionic Solutions. So looking at the IMRS, or the Intelligent Magnetic Resonance Stimulation System, which is the full spectrum of PMF applications, it includes a full body map with the housing aspect. It contains the IMRS local applicator probe and pad for smaller applications. It also includes the aspect of an integrated sound and light relaxation system. 
and an interactive monitoring and regulation system. So the IMRS full body mat uses a triple sawtooth waveform, one of the most difficult to produce, but also one of the most powerful along with the square waveform of the IMRS pad. And so looking at waveform formations, we know that the greatest impact or peak voltage will occur with the greatest rise and fall time of the waveforms, both the greatest rise and the greatest fall time of the waveform. So one of the most powerful, <coughs> excuse me, electromagnetic forces can actually be created with a sawtooth signal shape and that of the square waveform. So if we compare those shapes with this undulating sine wave that many systems are, are based upon, we can see how much more effective these waveforms will be. And along with that, the actual the triple sawtooth waveform is being one of the top, the most powerful aspects. So looking at field strength or intensity, going back to some of those setting guidelines that were discussed in the research studies that were done, if we look at the um, IMRS full body mat, it's three pairs of these tightly wound, pure non-insulated copper coils, which are very effective at penetration and treatment. When we look at this system and the way the mat is aligned here, we'll see that there's um, a higher increase of intensity at the foot, which emulates us walking on the uh, within the Earth's surface, or earthing, as that's been um, documented, going up to a, a lower intensity near the head, which is the natural way that we would walk into the Earth's surface. So uh, also for the aspect of putting small children or animals on the full body mat, you would want to put them up near the head for the lower intensity settings aspect. The pad applicator actually contains two pairs of these tightly wound copper coils. And they actually reverse polarity every two minutes so that your body does not acclimatize. And this goes back to some research studies that were done by NASA, which talked about the importance of uh, rapidly time varying and polarity reversing aspect so that our body does not acclimatize. And this is a major difference between systems that were using a magnetic system, which is a stagnant system, where your body will become used to it and, and you know, stop reacting to it, basically. The IMRS also has a lower low and a higher high of intensity uh, systems to accommodate both chronic and acute conditions. And again, going back to some of the research studies, some of them work better at a lower setting, some of them work better at a higher intensity setting. The IMRS also has a built-in database guide for users. And this is a database from over 20 years of clinical use. It has over 250 conditions within this program with over 2,000 pre-programmed setting guidelines for time and intensity. So you can go in here from A to Z, and we're just showing a few of the A's here. And going further into detail, for example, under autoimmune disease, would show you some different setting guidelines that have been utilized by other past users over the last 20 years. So it'll give you a good indication of uh, what aspects clash. It just gives you an, an aspect from A to Z of different conditions that pulse electromagnetic fields have had um, some um, aspect to, uh, to wellness or health. The interactive monitoring and regulation system is actually a biofeedback system. So it listens to the user's body and adjusts the intensity according to their heart rate variability. Now, heart rate variability has been used within clinical settings for many, many years and is a good indication of an autonomic nervous system. So the IMRS system taps into that as well, and every two minutes will um, read your heart rate variability and then adjust the intensity level according to what your heart rate variability is showing. The IMRS frequency levels, uh, they use frequencies that optimize cellular function. And again, we're going back to the uh, optimal biological window that we know um, with the Schumann resonances are um, that the earth produces and that our bodies are meant to live within and, and to uh, optimally have that optimal biological aspect of wellness within that. So there is built-in biorhythm time clock with four different settings, morning, noon, evening, and night, which will either help wake you up or calm you down. And these are frequency ranges um, similar to, the, for example, the alpha waves. The sound and light brain treatment therapy is actually a spa for your brain. It melts away stress, it improves oxygen circulation, it helps you enjoy a relaxing, restorative sleep, which is huge for people as far as the reparative aspect, because we know that that deep sleep 
is the processing time for our bodies to repair. So if you're not able to have that deep sleep, which many people are not, you're missing out on some of that repair aspect that your body would naturally do. So this also naturally improves emotional balance and will retrain your brain. And um, on Bionic Health today, under the blog site, there's an actual um, uh, whole setting on brainwave entrainment. So you can watch a video on that for more, much more detail than what we're able to go into here today. The Omnium One Intelligent Lifestyle System is a newly um, based system, which is based on the Android platform. It's the world's first tablet with a specific high performance battery, and it's equipped with two serial ports to run wellness apps, or WAPs as they're called. And those allow for tremendous uh, access to a range of health, wellness, and fitness related applications. So with the, this aspect of it being on an Android tablet, it actually has a tremendous portability aspect because you can take, of course, this Android tablet with along with some of the um, application systems here and take it wherever you're going. So similar to the IMRS, you've got a full body mat here that's scored and more than more portable and easy to carry. You have a, a pad system and you have an Omni spot, which is a homogenous system you can put on either side of the limb, for example, a knee or an elbow or a joint. And this creates a Helmholtz effect where it ping pongs back and forth with electromagnetic fields in both areas of the spot. So you have a, a total concentration throughout that limb area of an equal or homogenous um, electromagnetic field system. It also includes an Omni brain, which is like the spa for the brain. And of course the Android tablet with a six to eight hour battery life. So portable to be able to take the system in the car, for example, you can take it out, lie on an outside um, mat, have a spa therapy outside in the sunshine. So many different applications to be able to utilize this. Now, if you're looking at systems, you obviously want to investigate device safety, registration, and regulatory compliance. You don't want to bring a system into your country of choice that is not compliant with that country's regulatory system. Well, Swiss Bionic Solutions, the developer and manufacturer of the IMRS systems, is the only company worldwide which fulfills all country requirements for supplying PEMF devices for home use. So a very important factor when you're looking at systems is to look at that aspect of regulatory and device safety. So can you see how PEMF or pulse electromagnetic field influencers could impact cancer cell concerns? Could they possibly improve North American cancer statistics? Well, I think some of the research is certainly pointed in that direction. So we welcome your questions. We ask that you would either contact us or the friend who introduced you for your personal consultation and we'd love to just spend some time and really get your questions answered. You can contact us at bionichealthtoday.com under the contact slash book a consultation page. Or again, contact the friend who invited you to watch this uh, video. And uh, we would just really enjoy taking the opportunity to um, answer your questions and go through any questions or your individual concerns that you might have. So we want to thank you for attending our Wellness Wednesday and today's topic of C for cancerous cell concerns and PEMF influencers. Today's question of would it be okay to improve North American cancer statistics? And I do hope you answered yes for that because we again know how uh, horrific our cancer statistics are in North America and what an aspect that we could possibly positively influence our biological terrain through different lifestyle choices and different applications of non-invasive therapy that we've discussed here today. So this has been the A, B, C, and Ds of health concerns and we ask that if you're interested you can definitely watch more at bionichealthtoday.com slash blog I'm your host, Barbara Carr, Certified Health Consultant with Bionic Health Today. And if you've enjoyed this, please click below to share it with your friends and uh, family members. And thank you very much for attending. We want you to take joy in your journey, and we just so appreciate you being here today with us.